Hi everyone, Michael Sandler here, best-selling author and your host on Inspire Nation. Check out our website where we'll be posting podcasts, tips, videos, blogs, and more at InspireNationShow.com. Today we have an amazing guest who knows more about life and death than you could ever imagine and has very powerful insights into what this means for us. His name is Dr. Eben Alexander. Till 2008, he'd been a renowned academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years and taught at Harvard Medical um, Center for over 15 years. He thought he knew how the mind, brain, and consciousness worked, and that near-death experiences and any other unusual experiences were merely illusions or aberrations created by the mind. If someone was resuscitated and told him about it, perhaps seeing a bright light or visiting deceased loved ones, he'd very kindly and compassionately tell them it just wasn't possible. It wasn't science and that their mind made it up. Yet he'd seen a lot in the operating room and in the ER. He'd seen patients appear to die and come back. He'd seen miraculous bursts of lucidity or clarity just before people's death and much more than he couldn't even begin to explain. But as a hard-nosed scientist, he ignored people's stories, reports, and what he'd even seen with his own two eyes. And that made him such a perfect candidate for what would come next. But that's where we'll pick up the interview, talking today about near-death experiences, about the possibility of afterlife, about what the human brain does or does not do, or maybe to say why it doesn't let us see certain things, and why what he experienced means so much for us. This won't be all woo-woo because that's not where Dr. Alexander comes from. He comes from the linear, right brain, age of reason, scientific, prove it with science and statistics world. This is a life-changing interview. If nothing else, it'll stop you in your tracks. It'll give you a new perspective on life, on death, and of living your greatest life here on Earth. For myself, personally, I found Dr. Evan Alexander's book, Proof of God, and his second book, Map of Heaven, to be perhaps the most single important books I've ever read in this lifetime. And if you know my show, you know I read a lot. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Evan. Are you ready to shine? I am. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Very. Excellent. Well, before we dive deep into your story, can you tell me what you were like before the big event? Well, yes. I had grown up in um, a home where I was blessed with a father who was very scientific. He was actually uh, the chairman of a neurosurgical training program. He was also very religious, um, very spiritual, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I grew up in that environment, of course, growing up in the 60s and 70s and the heyday of scientific materialism and all the uh, kind of giddy progress we saw in science and technology in the 20th century. Uh, I realized that science is the pathway to truth. It is uh, the whole pathway. It's, it is the pathway. Uh, I realize now, though, mm -hmm. that the... Um, science that I worshipped at that time, reductive materialist science, our conventional science, is woefully inadequate. It is a kindergarten level of style of thinking that actually has nothing whatsoever to offer up about the nature of consciousness. In fact, that conventional science that I worship tried to tell you consciousness is an illusion of the physical workings of the brain. It tries to deny its very existence. And yet, my coma journey showed me something very differently, which is where the whole scientific world is headed, even as we speak. So, so you, I, have, I was very much. Do you have uh, Kevlar in the back of your chair there for the arrows that are headed your way? <laughs> exactly. I'm used to that. But, uh, you know, it, re it really is all about a much deeper understanding of that relationship of brain, mind, and consciousness. And that's what we're talking about. And the me before coma was very comfortably, deeply buried in that, uh, in that false sense of understanding of the nature of reality, uh, which says that the physical is all that exists, that the brain creates consciousness, that our existence is birth to death and nothing more. All of that is false. And my coma journey showed me very clearly uh, a more natural ordering of things that makes much more sense. So why don't you tell us then, share with us your story that happened on, began on November 10th in 2008. And with, with that said, as I was jotting notes for this and I wrote down November 10th, 2008, I went, Jessica, this happened on your birthday. 
Mm. So, <laughs> present. <laughs> the hair is kind of stood out. Beautiful present. Yes. Well, there are no accidents. That's one thing I've come to realize very fully. And of course, uh, uh, in Map of Heaven, I, I mentioned synchronicities and how we uh, we pay attention to that because mm -hmm. these things do not happen. To, uh, you know, it's not just coincidence. Uh, there's a lot of meaning buried uh, deeply and richly throughout all of our experience. So. Um, Taking you back to November yes. 10th, 2008, uh, where basically I, I woke up with severe back pain and then uh, uh, discovered when my younger son, Bond, who at that time was 10 years old, came in the room and uh, he was realized I was having tremendous uh, pain. He started rubbing my temples. As soon as he touched my head, I felt like he'd driven a white hot spike through my head. Wow. And that's about the last thing I remember. I was really gone from this world for seven days uh, after that point. And what I heard later from family uh, filled in the blanks. And that is that my family left me there to rest, thinking I was resting. I was actually lapsing deep into coma. And uh, in that process, I, they let me rest, came back about two hours later to check on me. I was having a grand mal epileptic seizure. Of course, I remember none of that. I remember nothing of the next seven days. I was already long gone from this world when my family found me having that seizure. From a physical perspective, what was going on at the time? Well, at the time, what, you know, what I figured out much later mm -hmm. is that my brain was being overrun uh, with an extremely aggressive, primitive, and absolutely should have killed me uh, bacterial meningitis. It was uh, uh, E. coli which mm -hmm. they found out on the second day. Uh, any doctors in the audience will realize that E. coli meningitis almost always happens in newborns. It's very rare beyond the age of three months. And uh, yet that's exactly what I had. And the numbers on it, it's uh, somewhere well under one in a 10 million chance that an adult spontaneously gets E. coli meningitis. I mean, it's extremely rare. Um, so to this day, my doctors uh, have no idea how I came down with this severe case of bacterial meningitis. You know, what was the mechanism of it? Uh, I'm sure that the rarity of it was there to help keep me focused, you know, so I wouldn't just kind of throw up my hands in despair and say, well, I guess uh, the dying brain does all kinds of tricks and, you know, weird things happen. Mm -hmm. Just got to forget about it. That's what my doctors encouraged me to do when I came back talking about the experiences I'd had. That's, that's interesting. I had uh, uh, two NDEs myself, and after the second one, um, in, in both of them they had occurred from uh, uh, trauma, falling. One that left me with a titanium femur and titanium hip on the left side mm -hmm. in a very rare way that it happened. And the second one left me with a matching identical titanium femur and identical hip on the right side that they said the odds of the first one were one in a million, the odds of the second happening, yeah. <laughs> one in infinity. And you got that same right. kind of thing, the right. bookmark that no way, right. just, the just same not kind possible. Of yeah, there are no accidents. So you, you have that symmetry across time for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's a crucial part of this. Uh, the, uh, not only the rarity of the disease, mm -hmm. but... Uh, you know, I started out that week with a one in, uh, you know, a t basically a 10% chance of survival. Yeah. Uh, but anyone who knows anything about bacterial meningitis realize if you go into coma from this and spend more than a few hours or day or so in coma, you're pretty much not coming back. And that's what my doctors knew very well. So what's going on? What's, what's, what's going on in the brain at that point as far as what's the bacteria doing? Well, the important thing to understand, and this uh, I came to realize in the months after my coma, is that such a, a case of bacterial meningitis in many ways is a perfect model for human death. Uh, the reason is that bacteria mm -hmm. very specifically and efficiently destroys the neocortex. It destroys the outer surface of the brain. The outer surface of the brain is the part that makes us human. Uh, you know, all of our experience as humans, everything about what we see and hear and think and our words and language and uh, our perception of bodily awareness and of our surroundings, uh, every single bit of that depends on the neocortex. It's not resulting from deeper structures in the brain. The deeper structures are more primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, they're something we have in common with, common with all other animals. But the thing that really makes the human experience special is the neocortex. Now other mammals have a similar neocortex, but one that is not as 
complex as ours. Uh, in humans, it really rises to uh, full form. Uh, and yet that was a gift by having such uh, a disease. I really could not have had a disease that would have been more perfect to help me try and understand the nature of consciousness and the relationship of the neocortex to the mechanism of consciousness than my bacterial meningitis. The only problem was, by the end of the week, I'd gotten so sick um, and had... Uh, uh, so I really the neocortex was, was basically knocked completely offline. It's as if it's dead. It was knocked offline in the first day. Uh, I mean, the last uh, evidence we have that uh, there was any kind of function coming out of my neocortex was within an hour or two of hitting the emergency room. And after that, it was all gone. It was just pathological reflexes or no response at all. That's what I had through most of that week. And although my doctor said that when I first got to the ER, seizing, in coma, I was at about a 10% chance of survival due to rapid progression down into coma. Uh, by the end of that week, seven days in that state, uh, with no sign of any kind of neurologic recovery, uh, no signs of improvement, at that point I was down to a 2% chance of survival uh, with no chance of recovery. In fact, they said best case scenario, if I was in that 2% category that would actually live through this, was the, that I would be in the hospital for a month or two, be transferred to a nursing home in a persistent vegetative state, and die there a few months later, never having awakened. So that's why... On Basically, the, the brain was cooked. Right. The, and my doctors, so on the seventh day, they were recommending just stopping the antibiotics. And that recommendation was because of the dismal prognosis without any hope for recovery. So yes, to this day, you can bet my doctors have no idea how I came back. Uh, and I can tell you, I often meet physicians who yep. are familiar with uh, E. coli or with uh, gram-negative bacterial meningitis, and they come up to me like they're looking at a ghost. And they shake my hand in kind of this mystified state and say, I cannot even believe you are alive. And uh, so that you, to me is a haunting mystery. Your doctors were literally then saying, it's, it's pretty much time to think about pulling the plug. Well, that's exactly what they were saying. It was time to just let me go. And of course, it was a few hours later yeah. uh, that I did start coming back to this world. But important to point out, um, and I, I mention all this in proof of heaven, but I don't know if I stressed it enough. When I was first coming back to this world, I had no memories whatsoever of Evan Alexander's life before coma. I had no idea who I was. My mother, my sisters, my son standing around the bedside, I had no idea who these beings were. The only thing I knew mm -hmm. was where I had been on this extraordinary odyssey that to me seemed to have taken up months or years. I mean, it was a very long, extensive odyssey, although it had to fit within seven Earth days. Yeah. And in fact, all the clues were there to show me that the vast majority of my coma experience happened between days one and five of coma. So now that you've got my hair standing up on end, <laughs> what what was the journey you took? Well, it all began in what I call the earthworm eye view, this very primitive course, unresponsive realm. It was like being in, buried deep in dirty jello. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember blue, uh, blood vessels or roots all around me, uh, kind of this scratchy sensation. I had no body awareness at all during any part of my journey. Uh, and in that very crude and primitive, uh, unresponsive realm, I had no language or words, none of my memories of, of the life of Evan Alexander, none of my religious concepts. I mean, I couldn't even sit there and wonder whether or not I was dead because uh, all such concepts were foreign to me. Uh, so this was a very primitive, primordial state of existence, uh, an empty slate, a tabula rasa, if you will. Um, I could still wonder, you know, what, where, who, uh, never a flicker of a response to any of that. And that earthworm eye view, I think if I had just come back from that, mm -hmm. I would have had what many people would call a hellish near-death experience uh, because it was kind of a hellish or purgatory type existence, even though I had no notion of those kind of words at the time. The good news is I didn't stay there forever. I was rescued, and that rescue came in the form of a pure, clear, white light that had fine white and kind of uh, gold and silver tendrils coming off of it. And it spun very slowly as it came towards me. And 
it opened up like a rip in the fabric of that ugly earthworm eye view and led up into this brilliant valley uh, that was absolutely ultra real and alive beyond any possible words. There was no sign of any kind of death or decay or anything in this valley. The valley is what I call the gateway valley uh, or gateway realm and it was uh, absolutely lush and filled with life. Uh, everything growing. I remember uh, buds, blossoms, flowers uh, that would just open in these rich textures. And I can was, still was remember it? the textures just from their feel, uh, even though I had no body awareness. But my awareness was reaching out and encompassing all of this, all of this. Was it kind of like experience. Earth? Was it like what? Like Earth. Well, you know, interesting, there were many kind of earth-like features in it, mm -hmm. uh, all of these plants and flowers and trees and butterflies. I was a speck of awareness on one beautiful butterfly, and there were millions of other butterflies all swooping and swirling in these uh, beautiful formations, waterfalls into crystal uh, clear pools, uh, mists rising up, this beautiful kind of unearthly light coming from all the clouds that were billowing up into the blue black velvety sky so it had earthly features but in in a sense much better to look at this as an ideal earth I I liken it often to Plato's world of forms that he describes in the Phaedo um, and I think that that's really a best way of looking at it because everything in that realm and that includes the souls of departed loved ones and and such is in their kind of perfect form uh, just like when you in, encounter a departed loved one in that mm -hmm. kind of environment of uh, like for example my father who only appeared to me many many years after my coma but he's appeared to me in meditation and that kind of thing and when he appears he's in his early 20s and he's extremely healthy with no infirmities whatsoever and that's the way things are in that realm they're in their kind of perfect form it's kind of where our higher souls are where we reunite with our soul groups where we go through life reviews every bit of it occurring in that realm which of course does have earth-like trappings so uh, what happened on the other hand it's far more than earth-like so what happened with you while you're there so you you get there and you're like i don't know what you're like <laughs> well, i was uh, absolutely shocked and awed and amazed and astonished by the beauty of that realm mm -hmm. on that butterfly wing and there were thousands of souls down below that i described in my early writings as uh dressed in peasant garb but very brightly colored uh clothing and, uh, you know, I thoroughly uh, was just mesmerized by the beauty and, and glory of this realm. I remember early on in the whole adventure, uh, this soft, warm summer breeze. It was kind of like a perfect breeze blowing through. And it was really my first awareness, given that this was a tabula rasa, that I had this amnesia for everything ever having occurred before. And that was all essential to the lessons that I was there to learn. But the important thing was that uh, I was deeply immersed uh, in that uh, beautiful, loving realm, amazed by it all. And uh, in fact, I was not alone on that butterfly wing. That was one of the most beautiful aspects of this. There was a lovely girl beside me, and I'll never forget her smile, the way she looked at me, her high forehead, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones. A broad smile. She never said a word. She didn't have to. Her thoughts came straight into my awareness. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You will be taken care of. You have nothing to fear. Uh, there is nothing you can do wrong. And of course, when she said that, I knew already by that point that I was deeply into this kind of soul school and awareness and that really this is all about learning the lessons and important mm -hmm. to realize that in, in our incarnations here in the physical realm, once we realize that the highest and best form of our ascendance towards oneness with the divine is manifesting that unconditional love for all fellow beings and showing love, compassion, acceptance, forgiveness, and mercy to all life and all of this uh, creation, uh, that we can do no wrong once we're at that point. Uh, but of course, that is part of the higher lesson we're here to learn and that um, so much of this soul growth has to do with uh, uh, leaving behind those false boundaries of self mm -hmm. that, and the ego and, and where it puts us uh, in this world and separates us from realizing the oneness that we all share so and that we're that, all truly here to share that love. Were you getting that while 
while traveling with her on the butterfly or is that something because I read about you traveling to to other places right well to... that actually all of that came later so yep. let me let me take you along uh, in that part of the journey and and uh, take me on that wing <laughs> sorry I'm having a getting ah now I'm better I'm okay better excellent okay the um, it turns out that that beautiful summer breeze was the first hint because that was my awareness of the divine. Mm -hmm. uh, that, when I look back on it, I, I call that breeze uh, the divine wind or the breath of God because that was my first knowing of the infinite healing power of that unconditional love blowing through that scene. And it all came right around the time that I was getting those beautiful messages, telepathic messages from the lovely girl on the butterfly wing that I had nothing to fear that I would be taken care of. Um, and it was in that setting that I was aware of all those things down below, all the dancing, joy, and birth, and there were children playing and dogs jumping, just the incredible festivities going on down below me, this, um, this festival that was being driven by these swooping orbs of angelic choirs up above uh, against that sky. And I remember them as these kind of oval orbs, and each one had an individual kind of spirit identity to it, but they were very high forms. These were ascended angels, and they were swooping, and as they did so in these uh, vast formations in the sky above, they would emanate these chants or hymns or anthems that would just blow through me like, uh, like a tidal wave, this incredible awe and power. And that's what was fueling all that joy and beauty down below uh, by all of the souls that were in this beautiful dance that I was witnessing. And of course, all this was also in the presence of that beautiful girl on the butterfly wing. But it turns out that just as that spinning melody mm -hmm. uh, that had first ushered my portal coming up out of the earth where I view into that gateway realm, music, notes, uh, the sound, the vibration, the frequency was what enabled uh, that portal to open. And likewise, uh, these swooping choirs of angelic beings uh, above that were emanating these incredible uh, hymns and chants down to me, they provided yet another portal up into higher and higher levels. And I remember seeing what I look back upon as four-dimensional space-time of this entire universe collapsing down and then the lower spiritual realms collapsing down above it and remember that time flow mm -hmm. in those lower spiritual realms is completely independent it's much more robust and fundamental about the nature of causality than time flow that so we you had no no real sense of time you could say well it's almost like you step outside of time and in that sense you start to see what time really is and the illusory nature of it which and makes that, absolutely no sense to me. I don't even know how to to wrap my mind around that concept. Well, it's it's something that uh, I believe people can definitely get to in deep meditative states, mm -hmm. and that's why I do a lot of the work I do now with sacred acoustics to help people get these tools to go into deep transcendental meditative states because you can get to a point there uh, fairly readily where you're actually able to step up and out of the illusion of the here and now of our four-dimensional space-time, and that's all part of the illusion that is painted for us by consciousness on this side of the veil. But we can thin that veil, and that's what happens in near-death experiences, or death experiences, shared death experiences, or all manner of, uh, say, out-of-body phenomena, remote viewing. There are many ways that we can thin that veil to get a glimpse of that and come to realize. But a, a deep lesson of a lot of my journey is the only way to see any of this is to take that higher perspective. And that's where, of course, reductive materialism, which is the, the, the way that our current science works, is taking the wrong approach. Uh, reductive materialism basically takes all the pieces apart down into these subatomic particles and then pretends that by understanding all the laws that link the subatomic particles, that we can come to an understanding of the entire universe. Which uh, a, a challenge. Sense. No, uh, it's a very challenge. Well, a big challenge with that is because to do that, to be that reductionist, you have to completely throw out the book on quantum mechanics. Right. <laughs> well, the good news is the book of quantum mechanics is right there, and it keeps banging our uh, head into reality mm -hmm. uh, by telling us that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. And, of course, that's where our modern physics community still struggles and wrestles so hard with this. As long as they are committed 
to saying, well, wait a minute, the physical universe is what exists. Consciousness is an illusion. There's no such thing as consciousness. It's only the material world. And they insist on that, and that's why they have the measurement problem and the deep enigma of quantum mechanics around the measurement problem that told brilliant people like Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Einstein that, uh, in fact, consciousness is fundamental at the structure of the universe. All of the material universe emerges from consciousness. I, I love and what Einstein says, uh, spooky action at a distance. That, <laughs> that, kind of, that captures uh, a key kernel of it all, the entanglement phenomenon. And uh, that's a big part of, of the mystery. And uh, that's something that uh, we can definitely get into. But the entanglement uh, problem, spooky action at a distance, of course, Einstein kept trying to say there had to be hidden variables. He thought that causality would be completely contained within all of the findings of the physical universe. And then, of course, uh, John Bell, the uh, Irish physicist in 1964, came up with ways through Bell's theorem to actually experimentally address that whole question of spooky action at a distance uh, versus hidden variables. And all of the experiments right up to the current uh, uh, era show very clearly that spooky action in a distance is the way the world works, that quantum mechanics is true, that the wave function is real. And what that really tells us at a deep level is that consciousness is fundamental and what drives all of everything that exists. In fact, you only need to postulate consciousness to explain everything that's happening in this world. You don't even need to postulate some external universe. We've uh, had on... Uh, we've, 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 we, we've had on Dr. Uh, Dr. Mika Swamy, we've had on Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, and, and it's fascinating, and you've gone down this same rabbit hole, that, that every, um, every quantum mechanic scientist who looks at this at a fundamental level ends up becoming a mystic. <laughs> it, it, you basically must, because that's the way the world works. You know, when people can bicker and say, well, I want a natural explanation, not a supernatural explanation. Mm -hmm. All we're doing here is talking about the explanation as we approach uh, the nature of reality and fundamental truth. So, um, and there are a lot of scientists who definitely get this, and that's the good news. They're not the ones who necessarily have the bully pulpit front page of the New York Times or Scientific American, although I must say I'm very heartened to see certain blog postings in Scientific American that show an openness to realizing that things like terminal lucidity mm -hmm. and after-death communications are absolutely real. And that's something we've seen in Scientific American blog postings in the last year. So Beautiful. that's a good sign. So, so take us, finish up this journey for us here. Okay. <laughs> Wrap up infinity, if you can. <laughs> if, and infinity it, and eternity. Why <laughs> do that in, in a soundbite here in the next 24 seconds? Yes, yeah. Uh, basically, those uh, swooping orbs of angelic choirs provided portals to higher and higher levels, seeing all of space and time collapsing down, and then even deep time and other orders of ca causality and higher spatial and temporal dimensions collapsing down into this complex oversphere. And at that point, I was out to what I call the core, infinite inky blackness filled to overflowing with the infinite healing power of unconditional love of that creative source, that God, that deity, that Om, as I call that deity, uh, in that core realm. And Why do you with, call it Om? Uh, because of the sound that I heard, the sound that was, uh, and again, you've got to remember, I mean, the skeptics really get lost here because they say, wait, you heard a sound? Obviously, we are so infinitely beyond the four-dimensional space-time physics that gives sound when airwaves impact the eardrum. But this is the way it comes back to us in our human mind and thinking. It's We have to use the words that we've developed uh, in this body, living in this incarnation. So it's not a sound like you hear here, but that's how it comes back as a memory. Uh, and it far transcends anything that the physics of our four-dimensional space-time could support as a sound. But the sound that I heard deep in that core realm with that brilliant orb of light that was there kind of in the three of us. My awareness, which I hope you realize by now, was all of consciousness far beyond the bounds of this earth awareness, conscious, you know, grand mind, mind at large, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
But it was in that core realm that so much of that was revealed about reincarnation, about the buildup of this uh, space time and of the higher uh, spiritual levels above and beyond this and about the laws of causality. Uh, so much of that explained in that core realm. But I was also told, you're not here to stay. You'll be going back, uh, but we have much to teach you. And that's exactly how it unfolded. The interesting thing is in the midst of those lessons in that core realm, I would su suddenly and inexplicably find myself right back down in that earthworm eye view. And the good news is, by remembering the musical notes of the melody, mm -hmm. I was able to rise back up and conjure up that spinning white light that served as the portal back up into the gateway realm, beautiful butterfly wing, and the girl and all of the souls standing below the angelic choirs above, and then back again into the core realm for more lessons. And I made this, uh, this loop journey uh, multiple times. And uh, was it even trying came... to teach you? Was it trying to teach you that that frequency, in a sense, that that's that's the doorbell? Or... <laughs> oh, I, I think well, certainly it was teaching me that sound and vibration, music, uh, is the way of doing this. This is mm -hmm. how we can engender these transcendental conscious states. And this is something that I love sharing with everyone because you don't have to have a near death experience or a death experience to come to know and see what I have known and seen. You can do it as a conscious being, but it does take the work. And the work uh, that I'm talking about is any form of deep centering prayer or uh, deep meditation. And of course, uh, the tools that I give to people who say, well, I can't meditate. I've got too active a mind uh, are the, the sounds that uh, I work with uh, sacred acoustics with Karen Newell and Kevin Cossey and developing of those sounds. And people can go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more about it. But the key is you need some form of turning off the little voice in our head and going within. As you start to realize, as my lesson told me very clearly, and what I point out, proof of heaven and the map of heaven, um, is given that the entire universe is really in consciousness, um, mm -hmm. that going within consciousness is our way of getting out into the entire universe. That's why meditation and going within is the key to all of this. The answers lie within us all. That's the uh, title of the uh, appendix in the book, The Map of Heaven, where I go into this work with sacred acoustics, and that all of us can go there. You don't need a near-death experience, but it does take the work. And by the work, I mean uh, you know, a lifelong practice. I try to meditate an hour or two every day, if more if I can. I've been doing that for more than four years now, and I promise you it is well worth the time spent. So, so what, and, and that's something that I practice as well, although I, I must admit, while I practice it every day, I just made a commitment after reading um, your book, The Map of Heaven, uh, ah. to, to, uh, to go to Sacred Acoustics and, and either download or listen to at least that sample every day. I want to try doing that for at least a few week period. After my first near-death experience, I, I downloaded Hemisync. I started I started working with Ohm chant. I was drawn to sound, and and I started to forget some of that um, after my second near-death experience, which actually I, I went immediately after that experience to Ohm. But then I started to forget some of that until this book, Map of Heaven. I went two pages in. And I skipped to the appendix, and that's immediately what I jumped to. Good. And I said, Jessica, why aren't we doing this again? <laughs> I'm yeah. jumping on the yeah, book it's, here. Believe me, it is well worth it. And I'll tell you what, it's interesting you bring all that up because there's another resource uh, that we've just finished. Karen Newell and I mm -hmm. did a webinar with um, Evolver Learning Labs. Uh, and we did that webinar from early June into mid-July, yeah. uh, but the recordings, I believe, are still available. People can go to Evolver Learning Lab and get them. And it's uh, basically five sessions that we did, each one 90 minutes long, and they come with us, uh, certain exercises. And in, the, in that webinar, Karen and I go into great detail about uh, all of this, about uh, my journey, about uh, you know the meditation, about the sound, how we use the sound, how the sound is generated, why it's so powerful, why is it that differential frequency sounds like this can have such a tremendous impact in liberating conscious awareness from the shackles of the physical brain. 
Uh, and we talk about all of that. So that's a good resource if you're interested in learning more, is just go to Evolver Learning Labs and uh, go to that recent webinar that we did together and go through those recordings. Excellent. So, so let's, let's dive back into the, into the story here. Uh -huh. um, and and we, we may actually jump into that in a, in a future segment as well. So you come back from this experience, fast forwarding way ahead, you come back, they've pretty much written you off and you, you, you say more or less, I'm back. <laughs> more and, or less. <laughs> <laughs> and, and first off, was it real? Couldn't this have been just what you described us? And forgive me for saying this, because I've been down the rabbit hole a little bit myself. Mm -hmm. or, or, or couldn't this just have been a grand hallucination? Well, you know, it was, as I told my older son, Eben IV, when, mm -hmm. and he was majoring in neuroscience in college at the time, um, he had been there four days and nights holding my hand with other family members. That first night he'd walked in was my first night in the hospital. He know, knew enough neuroscience at the time to realize when he came in and saw that corpse being ventilated 12 times a minute by the machine that his dad was already gone. Mm -hmm. So he had been through all of that and of course through the mystery when I started coming back to this world. And he came home two days after I got out of the hospital. He drove home from school. It was the day before Thanksgiving, 2008. And uh, he gave me a big hug and he looked at me and he told me later he could tell I'd been transformed. It was like there was a light shining within me that I was far more present than I'd ever been. But what I told him at the time, I said it was way too real to be real. <laughs> and I was dead serious. It was. And my doctors had told me enough at that time about how sick I'd been, how my whole neocortex had been devastated. They had no idea how I was even coming back to this world. But anything I tried to tell them in terms of a story of what had happened deep in coma, they would pat me on the back and say, well, your brain was full of pus, your neocortex was being devastated. No wonder you were amnesic for your life before because your neocortex was completely gone. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it had to be some trick of the dying brain. And so that's where I was coming from when I first came back. It was truly way too real to be real. And at that point in my analysis, I thought, well, it means that there's something about meningitis destruction of the neocortex that kind of unmasks some hyper real piece of uh, conscious awareness. And I thought it was brain based and I was trying to figure that out. And of course, that's what um, Proof of Heaven has nine hypotheses that I entertained with some of my fellow colleagues in neuroscience interested in consciousness with my doctors, those who were taking care of me trying to explain all this. Uh, we were trying to come up with some way of explaining this as occurring in the brain yeah. as a trick of the dying brain. But of course, that's where after a while I just completely uh, gave up because there really was no way to explain this ultra real, uh, astonishing reality. And you know what, I, what I'm talking about having been there, um, that in fact, I do not believe that my brain even now uh, fully intact could muster that ultra reality in the strange, same absolutely stunning, astonishing sense. It's, I, I try to explain to people this uh, idea of hyper reality. Uh, it's like consciousness drinking it through a fire hose. I mean, because it's not coming through the normal channels. Mm -hmm. Remember that whenever we see with the eyes and hear with the ears, our brain then does a tremendous amount of filtering of that sensory information to reduce it down to this minuscule trickle. And that's what we live on and think that that is our current reality. So uh, I, I'm diving back to your hypothesis briefly. I went through each of them myself and, and you know, I'm trying to, trying to put on my, my, my science cap. I've got a, a science degree, among other things. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going after it. And each one, I come to the same thing. Brain's offline. That makes no sense. Brain's offline. Right. That one makes no sense. Still no brain. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, the reality here is what my journey showed me very clearly. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely rock solid, is the brain does not create consciousness, period. That's huge. And I promise you, the scientific world is getting on board with this full speed. The mistake is thinking the physical brain creates consciousness out of physical matter. Mm -hmm. And that is completely wrong. And that's been a tremendous problem uh, for those in neuroscience and philosophy of mind, uh, you know, for the better part of the last century. Uh, the, and the model that replaces it is something called the filter theory, where consciousness is fundamental. Uh, and this, of course, is something that I allude to in Map of Heaven, 
uh, talk a bit about in Proof of Heaven, but I'm definitely getting into in a lot of my presentations and in uh, some of the writing that we're doing now uh, is that filter model and how it really works. So what were you like when you came back? Was, was Evan still Evan? Well, you know, my, my sisters will tell you my sense of humor was there from the get-go. Uh, and as I point out in Proof of Heaven, our sense of humor is a great big indicator that we are not simply zombies or these uh, uh, kind of automatons that people like Richard Bennett and others would say we are. The sense of humor and the sense of irony yeah. is actually a beautiful clue as to the divinity within us all and our connectedness to each other and with that divine creator. Uh, and my sense of humor was in full force right when I came back to this world. Uh, and But I must say that there was a tremendous amount missing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I didn't remember anything of my life before coma. All that kind of dribbled back over weeks and months. Uh, my sisters, two of them, Phyllis and Betsy, would stay uh, in cots at my bedside in, in the step-down unit, the neuro step-down, after I got out of the ICU. Uh, and I didn't sleep night or day. I was really kind of batty. And uh, my sisters would share these uh, memories uh, of things we'd done when we were kids. And at first, none of it was in my memory at all. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. That sounds so wonderful. And But then slowly the memories really started coming back. Yeah. Uh, and after a month or so, it was really all back. After two months, I would say all of my knowing in more than 20 years spent in academic neurosurgery, everything I knew about physics, chemistry, biology, neuroscience, every bit of it was back by eight weeks. But in was fact, Eben, was Eben back? Uh, Eben was on his way back. Uh, you know, I was still... You know, believe me, uh, and I'm, I, I know I don't have to explain this to you because you've been there. Because I never, I never fully came. Th there's me that died twice. And, uh -huh. and so I look back at the photos of who I was, and it's not me. It's uh -huh. me, but it's not me. <laughs> well, I think this is all about awakening to who we truly are. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to point out in this kind of discussion that, you know, if I go back 20 years ago, yep. the me of 20 years ago, basically all the molecules in my body have been switched out since then. So obviously I'm not the same material being. Yep. Even though I have memories of things that happened, you know, 60 years ago, I can remember things when I was one and two and three years old. Mm -hmm. And clearly those memories are not uh, being supported through any kind of material mechanism in my brain that's the same material that was there when the, when the memories were formed. Those molecules have been switched out many times, but this is part of understanding that memories don't get stored in the brain anyway. You're making me think of Dropbox. So I uh, have, a, you know, a, a storing memories in the cloud. <laughs> well, in essence, that's what's going on, but the cloud is outside of four-dimensional space-time. The real cloud is the fundamental uh, realm of our spiritual uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really the, the thing that exists. I mean, the material realm is the stage on which the drama unfolds, but it's very much a facade. Uh, I mean, the materialist scientists are the first to tell you there's no material to the material world. You know, as you get into string theory, quantum gravity, what have you, uh, the discussions are all around vibrating strings of energy in higher dimensional space-time, but they're not about you know, the solidity and the, and the mass and the, in, and the inertia of things here. Those are all concepts that get kind of uh, laid in by our consciousness on this side of the veil. Uh, but the, uh, the kind of illusory nature of it is, uh, is right there if you look. And that's where the materialist science, scientists are so amazed by it all. And yet we all need to be more amazed by that. And of course, the next step for the for the physical scientists is to realize the role of consciousness, that it's not created by the brain at all. And that's where it starts to get much more interesting. So talking about the brain then, you were talking, you, you came up with an insight in here and, and it may not be unique, it may be, um, that the brain has to, to help us to survive here in this environment. Uh, for instance, I think of, of some of the most brilliant minds um, in, in Cambridge uh, trying to cross the street. Um, <laughs> and, and it seems like there's a, a, a direct relationship between brilliance and an inability to get across the street. Um, right. <laughs> it, 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 it seems like the brain has to really narrow down our focus 
to help us, and this is something that you really honed in on in, in your books, to help us survive in this plane of consciousness or this plane of existence. That is very much the case. It makes, you know, every moment, every breath, is an absolute astonishing miracle beyond description. And yet if our brain were sitting there and our mind were completely blown away by the miracle of, of every moment that is truly there, mm -hmm. uh, we would quickly become prey to whatever predator was around looking for lunch and that would be the end of the story. Uh, so that's not the kind of qualities that has survived through Darwinian evolution. Uh, but. The key is, you're exactly right, our, our brain and mind have this incredible ability to make all of this look very mundane because we have to be on the alert mm -hmm. for the dangerous things that might end our life or might be there to offer up our next lunch. Um, the good news is, as civilized human beings, we don't have to use all of our waking moments uh, just to be play the predator-prey game, and that's why it's so important to realize that yes, our uh, mind and consciousness can actually do far more uh, than just get caught up in that game. But the ego and those boundaries of self are part of that predator-prey game. So a huge part of this is rising above uh, those false boundaries of separation. Which is like meditation, which is, which is the uh, sacred acoustics, and exactly. other things to help, help step beyond that. So right. Jessica always likes me uh, at this point in an interview to ask a question about children, about kids, or about infants. And in this case, um, we were talking about the brain and talking about its, its um, throttling back the pipeline, so to speak, uh -huh. um, for, our, for our own good. And she wonders if kids come into this world with that same throttle back or that same depth of the veil, or whether you believe when kids come in, they're still more aware of, of the totality of it all. I'm, I'm quite uh, convinced that when kids come in freshly from that realm, mm -hmm. because reincarnation is absolutely an essential part of all this, um, that they are, you know, kind of blown away by this, being re-immersed in all this, but they come in, the veil is already starting to form, even though young infants uh, just exude that energy uh, of that heavenly realm. They are just filled with it, and it doesn't take a lot of perceptual uh, intuition uh, to know that. If you hold a newborn or just interact with a newborn, you, you just feel the power of that. Uh, it's just a, a beautiful gift. Uh, and I'm convinced that you know a lot of what goes on with children, uh, with their playing and their playmates and all, uh, especially imaginary playmates, which uh, many, many times can be souls of departed loved ones like grandparents or uh, departed parents who they may not have have known even when alive and yet they know their names and they know enough about of uh, interacting with them that if you question the child you start to learn that they really must be interacting with the soul of that departed loved one so yeah I think that they very much get it and there's a tremendous literature on past life memories in children uh, you know the works of Ian Stevenson Jim Tucker especially from UVA yeah. more than 2500 cases of past life memories in children where that's the best uh, the best explanation for the empirical data uh, is that and not some other uh, materialist pseudo explanation. Uh, so it really is uh, to me apparent that uh, young infants in particular uh, and young children have a very, very thin veil and they see spirits and souls all the time. That's part of their existence, but it gets covered over, especially in our culture. In is, our Western is, there culture. A, is there a way as, as parents or future parents is there anything with this awareness, particularly this awareness that you've gained, that we can try to protect that so that, that they're still in and of this world, which gets to my next question actually right. in a minute, but, but they're still more connected? Yeah, I think the main thing is to basically honor their stories and listen to what they're saying and interact uh, and let them expound on what they're telling you um, and just be open-minded about what can be real and remember that we are extremely blinded to the nature of reality. Our eyes and ears uh, themselves are very, very limited within a narrow bandwidth of, of frequency possibilities, whether you're talking about the ear and, and sound or talking about the eyes and electromagnetic spectrum. And of course, we have no way of knowing 
what other windows we would need to access all of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the <laughs> biggest mistakes that the materialists make is thinking, well, if we just access all of reality available through our physical senses and through our instrumental expansion, say of telescopes and microscopes expanding on the eyes, things like that, then we will get to all of reality. That is uh, a very brazen uh, hubristic assumption that's like uh, that saying, is false. That's like saying through watching a TV, we'll be able to experience all of infinity. <laughs> exactly, and that's not the way the universe works. But within consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, we can come to access far more. And that's why it's so important to go within. And I think the important thing with children is just to honor what they're experiencing and, and look at what they are sharing with you. The, the fact that their veil is still very thin, that they have ready access uh, into these spiritual realms and into souls of departed loved ones and other people and telepathy. They can, they can know things far beyond the ken of their physical senses. Look at them as teachers and honor I them in it. that way. Uh, and, and look at this as it truly is. All of our human experience, mm -hmm. uh, this is soul school. We're all here to learn and to teach. And we can learn a lot from young children, from infants, uh, and, and help them tremendously by also honoring that and allowing them to grow up realizing that what they sense to be true is true as opposed to being told by some adult that can't be you know nan had died two years before you were born so you can't possibly know nan nan and yet the kid is obviously playing with nan nan so <laughs> open up get used to it open your mind a bit uh that's what this is all about yeah. Uh, you have a, uh, a beautiful quote towards the end of the book. It's not actually your quote, but I found it, and it's actually at, at the back of the map of heaven, um, a quote from Aldous Huxley, a uh, famous writer, and uh, he says, th and you include this, that's the important part, this world is an illusion, but it is an illusion we must take seriously right. because it is real as far as it goes. We must find a way of being in this world while not being in it. Why did you include this and what does this mean to us? It's very crucial to realize because so often I'm going out there and saying that this material realm is illusory. Mm -hmm. That does not mean it's unimportant. In fact, I would say the entire universe exists to support sentient beings being temporarily incarnated in these forms where we know full well that we'll be partially dumbed down to the level we have to be to exist in these incarnations. But that's because that's how we learn the lessons. That's how we all learn and teach these lessons. The most fundamental lesson mm -hmm. that mankind is working on now is that lesson of unconditional love for our fellow beings. There are certain aspects coming from my point of view of the destiny of humanity, certain capabilities that are latent with all, within all of us as sentient beings, but we cannot be allowed to fully manifest those capabilities until we more thoroughly love one another, love ourselves, love all other beings, show compassion, mercy, acceptance, forgiveness across the board, because some of these abilities that I see coming to us as sentient beings can only come when we have mastered that ability to love ourselves and love others. And that's what so much of this is all about. And when we get that, it sounds like what you're alluding to is when we fully learn how to love ourselves and thereby by loving ourselves, we are loving everyone. It's not the narcissistic, right. I love myself. No, no, it's but not. But when we get that, our frequency, boink. <laughs> Way up. And that's what we're all participating in now is this awakening uh, that has to happen. It's inevitable as far as I'm concerned. It'll be the most fundamental shift in all of recorded human history. Beautiful. So what are, I use the word beautiful, and I use that word too much because uh, uh, honestly, it's something you talk about in, in your book. Yeah. Sorry, I'm I, guilty too. I don't have words. Right, right. Jessica's well, that's, like, stop saying beautiful. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's part, that's another reason why I encourage souls to go within. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can all come to experience this by being a conscious being. Uh, and that's why the work with sacred acoustics is so important for those who do not already have a way of meditating or centering prayer, etc. But uh, that is, is really the key. And also realizing the truth behind the fact that we are all one. And it's not just about humans. 
And it's not limited to life on earth. We are all one with all sentient beings throughout, throughout all of eternity and infinity. And that is part of it. And the loving that great oneness uh, is really truly loving ourselves, as you say. Uh, realizing it's not a selfish love. It's not an egocentric love at all. This is about loving ourselves for the grand spiritual beings that we truly are, interconnected with all other spiritual beings, and directly to the divine creator. So it's really about waking up to that. And, and of course, I hope that people realize that Proof of Heaven and Map of Heaven are very much about rising above the false dogma of separation that is inherent in materialist science mm -hmm. and also inherent in some of the dogmatic interpretations of modern religions. And by separation you mean that either there's God and there's us or there's life and then there's an end to life. That is, right. that we are not all part of that fabric or that uh, um, life is always. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's a big part of it. The, a lot of the real confusion in our modern thinking mm -hmm. comes from any kind of false separating out of parts from the whole. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's right at the core of the problem in quantum mechanics. That's what drives uh, me nuts about science. It. All these theories seem weird because they're all taken in a vacuum. Right, exactly. And of course, that's why when you try and blend them together, like quantum mechanics and relativity, you wind up with nonsense. <laughs> uh, because literally, there got to be some major problems in one or both of those theories, and yet they both seem to function so well mm -hmm. uh, where they're applied, you know. Uh, so that's really a huge part of the problem, though, and that's why the top-down approach that I mentioned earlier, that you can get through meditation, makes far more sense to me in terms of coming to grips with the nature of truth and reality than the bottom-up approach that is inherent in reductive materialism, which is the MO of our modern scientific materialism. So what are three takeaway pieces of advice? Small question. <laughs> three takeaways you give people. I think the most important takeaway, mm -hmm. first of all, is remember that you are far, far more than this, this little teeny uh, body living birth to death and nothing more. Yeah. You are an infinitely greater creature than that. You're far more interconnected. You have far more power to control unfolding reality. So I'd say, in essence, that's probably the most important uh, uh, initial lesson is to realize you're far more and that this physical world is only a tiny microcosm of what truly exists. Another thing to remember is at the core of it all, that infinitely powerful creative source mm -hmm. loves you more than you can possibly imagine. That God loves each and every one of us as part of this creation. That's why love is so important and it has infinite power to heal. And that, uh, you know, whether you're talking about healing the individual, mm -hmm. healing the soul group, mm -hmm. uh, healing all of humanity, all of life on earth, healing all of consciousness beyond, uh, unconditional love is the secret to healing every bit of it. I want to say I love you and I love that. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a fact. And I mean, we see this uh, all the time in, in a practical sense. For example, uh, you know, I look at the response of, of, of the church in Charleston, South Carolina, where mm -hmm. they had uh, nine people murdered, um, you know, a few weeks ago. And look at the response of the families uh, in that congregation that were so willing to forgive the perpetrator. And that kind of forgiveness, right at its very heart, is the beginning of the solution for this whole world. And the more we can all come to realize the power of unconditional love, mm -hmm. of acceptance, forgiveness, and mercy, uh, the more this world will change. And each and every one of us can serve as a point of light uh, to bring that unconditional love to this world. I think that's a big reason why near-death experiences have been, even though they're an ancient phenomenon, they go back thousands of years, uh, but you know, the universe really upped the ante back in the late 1960s when they enabled doctors to bring back cardiac arrest patients. <laughs> and so now we have populated the world with tens of millions of yeah. souls who have been to the other side and come back to tell the tale. And that is no accident. Uh, that is part of this world awakening, well, and that's I, why it's such a gift. When I read this book, and we still need to get to number, th number three in the list, when I read Proof of Heaven, um, have you seen the movie The Matrix? I have. 
it, this book is as if Neo came back and wrote a book <laughs> and shared what he experienced. <laughs> That's kind of like uh, Hollywood would portray it. I don't know if you if you look on um, on YouTube, there's a, a Monroe Institute mm -hmm. uh, video when I spoke there at their professional seminar back in 2012. Uh, and I ended my talk yep. with a scene from the end of the Matrix. Of so course. if you're interested, you can check out that little YouTube, uh, and especially the very end of it, because I did exactly the same thing. Uh, but that's how Hollywood treats it. And, and I'll see if I can put a, a link on our website to that, make it easier for people. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. That would be good. But I, I'm saying the reality yep. of what this world is headed for is far more shocking and powerful uh, than the way Hollywood portrays Neo. I promise <laughs> this is much, much bigger than The Matrix. So what's, what's uh, piece of advice number three? I think piece of advice n uh, number three is uh, that uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And uh, in, in essence, uh, you know, karma is absolutely real. You, you cannot get out of this, uh, this world without paying for, uh, you know, what you've done. So if we bring uh, suffering and pain and, and misery to others, mm -hmm. we're hurting ourselves and we will either make amends for it in this life Mm -hmm. or we'll have to do it uh, in our life review. You know, your life flashes before your eyes. Well, that's absolutely real. That's not some new age stuff that's just uh, been put out in some recent books. That's right there in uh, Plato's account of Ur, the Armenian soldier killed in battle 2,400 years ago. He came back realizing that the love you give is uh, what you get back from this universe. And that's exactly what he told uh, others around him. And um, you don't get off scot-free. I mean, the Christianity that I grew up with mm -hmm. that basically said you can sin, sin, sin until the end of, the, end of your life and then uh, uh, profess to believe in Christ and you get off scot-free. Well, the universe doesn't work like that. The universe is absolutely rock solid into learning and teaching and you pay for the lessons. But you, uh, I, I want to clarify here from a second, from at least my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, which is karma. Every action has has a, a, a reaction, a cause and effect, but it does not mean punishment. No, it doesn't mean punishment, but what it means is uh, as taking this broad perspective I'm talking about, the, mm -hmm. the way back perspective that sees the power of that unconditional love in this world, um, I would say that that the karma is really seeing this soul school for what it is. And mm -hmm. that is, we must be willing to learn the lessons that we are here to learn. Learn and teach the lessons we're here to learn. Um, my soul partner in all of this, Karen Newell, who is uh, one half of Sacred Acoustics, um, she taught me, be the love that you are. And in essence, it's not just about loving and acting love and being the verb of love, but having it be your identity. Uh, and that is really the purest way of ascending towards uh, oneness with the divine. Uh, but we have free will. Uh, and this is uh, the real focus of, of my next work is, uh, in writing is trying to put together free will. But the whole thing about free will yep. is it's part of the engine that drives the lessons we're here to learn and teach. And we have free will to make the mistakes. That's why my guardian angel told me, you can do no wrong. In essence, uh, you've got to be willing, though, to face up for the price if you uh, insist on uh, being egocentric, uh, you know, very selfish, very hurtful of others. You're going to pay the price for that because that does not follow the prime directive of dispensing love and oneness and togetherness and sharing that unconditional love with the world. And that's why it's so important to understand karma and the soul school nature of all this, and that we have free will for a reason, but it's that we must demonstrate in our free will yeah. making the correct choices, which is loving ourselves, treating ourselves and all other beings with the dignity and respect that all divine creation deserves. Beautiful. When, when to, to give people hope, and, and we don't have time to dive down this rabbit hole, but just as, as a little nugget to, to give people here, when we're talking about karma, when we're talking about such things, is I found it really hopeful in here that because of free will, uh, one of the things you've learned, correct me if I'm not getting this right, is that there there is evil here on earth, and there, there is evil 
in the whole fabric of the universe that's right. part of this whole free will but it's more here not that there's a ton of it here but there's more here for the learnings and that in in all of the cosmos it's fractionally small that is correct and what i would say is even though people are often kind of shocked by the amount of evil and apparent you know apparent evil and darkness in this world none of it would withstand a day of each and every soul manifesting that unconditional love of the creator for the creation every bit of darkness and evil would be dispelled so it's really a choice that is left up to us mm -hmm. uh, to manifest that love and the power of that love i came to see in my journey this is not a battle between good and evil that uh... one way i see it is that the apparent evil and darkness are simply the the lack uh, the absence of that light and of that love Fear. and we can each serve to bring that light and love into this world and no matter how the dark how dark the valley that you may be walking of and, and the loss that you may experience in this life and wondering how in the world could a loving God allow this to happen to me losing a loved one or a child or what have you remember that if you're willing to learn the lesson and teach the lessons that are often involved in that dark journey uh, that the ridge that, that learning those lessons allows you to rise up to has far more light and brilliance and love to more than compensate for the darkness and evil of that, of that valley. So oh, just man. remember and trust <laughs> knowing that. So a last question for you, which is what brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo <laughs> factor? It's really just... Um, I mean, I must say the, the biggest joy I get in the world is uh, being with my uh, sons, my two sons, mm -hmm. spending time with them, with other loved ones. Um, you know, it's all about relationships. Nothing else matters. And so it's what we do with our fellow souls in these soul groups. All of those interactions that are worth more than anything you could ever accumulate in this material universe. Uh, so it's really all about that, about relationships and interactions with other sentient beings and manifesting that love. And every bit of that uh, is why I live breath to breath today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Where can people go to find out more about your book? If they go to eben, E-B-E-N, alexander.com, mm -hmm. uh, you can learn, learn a lot more there. Go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more about the sound meditations. Uh, people who want to learn a lot more about frontier science, I often steer to Eternia, E-T-E-R-N-E-A dot org to learn more there. Um, and really uh, reach out to me either through evanalexander.com uh, or through the sacredacoustics.com website. Uh, my sole partner in all of this, Karen Newell, is uh, very responsible and she's often there at Sacred Acoustics uh, helping people to learn more and uh, work along this beautiful journey that we all share together. Excellent, excellent. And for more information, people can also visit our website, inspirenationshow.com. We'll have more on this topic. We'll also have a link to be able to get your book as well. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, live like there's heaven here on earth, and shine bright. <laughs> Thank you Great. so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, and talk I look soon. forward to uh, uh, speaking to you soon where we'll talk about uh, sacred acoustics and uh, we'll go down this very special rabbit hole as well. That sounds great. I look forward to it. So, All right. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Michael. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>